Hello and welcome back to the whole Bible series. This week we are studying the book of 1 Samuel. So 1 Samuel or Shmuel is part of the former prophets in the Tanakh. In the Bible, 1 Samuel is part of the Old Testament historical books. It tells a story of God choosing a king for Israel that he knows the people will follow. And this is manifested through the prophet, priest, judge, Samuel. First and second Samuel were originally one book that covered the establishment of the monarchy in Israel. For this reason, they are called first and second kingdoms in the Septuagint. And first and second kings are called third and fourth kingdoms. Uh, for more information on this, go back to episode 10. First Samuel is the ninth book of the Bible. Who wrote 1 Samuel and when? So Hebrew tradition holds that Samuel was written by Samuel during his time as high priest. However, the, the text does not give us any or clue to who the author is. Also, because Samuel dies uh, towards the end of 1 Samuel, Samuel obviously could not have authored the entire work, uh, but his writings may have contributed to the book's composition later by a, another writer or editor. Again, for more information, go back to episode 10. First Samuel is broken into four sections. Uh, but first, where we ended off in the end of Judges and Ruth. So the Israelites have failed to follow the commands of Yahweh, and they get stuck in this cycle of turning their backs away from God and then coming back to him begging and pleading when he turns them over to the nations. Uh, and so we're at a point now where this has gone on uh, for far too long and the people keep devolving and getting worse and worse. And so there's, they're at a breaking point. And so this is where the book of first Samuel comes into play. So we see the timetable here. We still quite haven't made it on the timetable itself. The first Samuel covers from about 1080 BC to about 1000 BC for the first section. Chapter one, there was a certain man of Ramathaim Zophim in the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, son of Elihu, son of Tohu, son of Zoph, and Ephrathite. He had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Peninnah. Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. Now this man used to go up year by year from his city to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh. Remember that Shiloh is where the tabernacle is set up. <clears throat> where the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests of the Lord. On the day that Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Peninnah, his wife, and to her, all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. Or, excuse me, her womb. Now, if you remember back several episodes ago, we talked about uh, barrenness and, and that it was perceived as a uh, curse from God. And so Hannah was not blessed. Verse six, and her rival used to provoke her grievously to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went by, or so it went on year after year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore, Hannah wept and would not eat. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? And why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? After they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah arose. Now the Eli the priest was sitting on a seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give your servant a son, then I will give to him or I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall touch his head. <clears throat> now, if we remember back to uh, 
the book of Judges. Uh, this is the same thing that happens uh, with the Nazarites. So this is a Nazarite vow. Uh, and this is something that we've seen here before. Chapter, excuse me, verse 12. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was speaking in her heart. Only her lips moved and her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli took her to be a drunken woman. And Eli said to her, how long will you go on being drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered, no, my Lord, I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman. For all along, I've been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. Then Eli answered, go in peace and the God of, of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. And she said, let your servant find favor in your eyes. Then the woman went her way and ate and her face was no longer sad. Verse 19, they rose early and in the morning and worship before the Lord. And they went back to their house in Ramah and Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son whom she called his name Samuel. For she said, I have asked him for, from the Lord. So there's a little note here at the bottom. It says Samuel can be understood as a combination of the root to hear and God. Uh, and so when you take his name in this context, it means that Hannah was heard by God or that Samuel comes from God because he heard Hannah's prayer. Verse 23. So the woman remained at home and nursed her son until she weaned him. And when she had weaned him, she took him with, up with her along with a three-year-old bull an ephah of flour and a skin of wine. And she brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh, and the child was young. Then they slaughtered the bull, and they brought the child to Eli. And she said, O oh my Lord, as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who is standing here in your presence praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition, and I made that I made to him. Therefore I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is lent to the Lord." And he worshiped the Lord there. So uh, here Hannah has devoted Samuel to the purposes of Yahweh. And so Hannah goes on and she praises Yahweh. Uh, chapter 2, verse 11. Then Elkanah went home to Ramah and the boy was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli the priest. So he's now working for Eli at the tabernacle. Uh, we find out that Eli's two sons were worthless men and that they didn't know Yahweh at all. And so Eli rebukes them. But in contrast, uh, the book makes clear that Samuel grows in uh, the presence of the Lord. Look at verse 26 of chapter 2. Now the boy Samuel continued to grow both in stature and in favor with the Lord and also with man. Then we see later that God re rejects Eli's household. Verse, 20, verse 27. And there came a man of God to Eli and said to him, Thus says the Lord, and this, sh and this that shall come upon your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, shall be the sign to you. Both of them shall die on the same day. And I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who shall do according to what is in my heart and in my mind. And I will build him a sure house that he shall go in and out before my anointed forever. So here God has rejected the sons of Eli because they're evil men. And he promises not only that they're going to die, but that he's going to raise up uh, his own new priest. Chapter three. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his own place. The lamp of God has, had not gone out yet. And Samuel was lying in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. 
Then the Lord called Samuel. And he said, here I am. And ran to Eli and said, here I am for you called me. But he said, I did not call him. Lie down again. So he went and lay down. And the Lord called again Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, here I am for you called me. But he said, I did not call my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. And the word of the Lord had not been revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again a third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, here I am for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore, Eli said to Samuel, go lie down. And if he calls you, you shall say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood. So here we have uh, language about uh, God being there in, in, in his presence. And the Lord came and stood, calling us as at other times. Excuse me, let me go back. And the Lord came and stood, calling as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, speak for your servant hears. Then the Lord said to Samuel, behold, I'm about to do a thing in Israel at which the two ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. On that day, I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. And I declared to him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. Therefore, I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned by or for by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord and Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. But Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. And he said, here I am. And Eli said, what was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you and more. Also, if you hide anything from me that he told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And he said, this is, it is the Lord. Let him do what it, he seems, let him do what seems good to him. And Samuel grew and the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was established as a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again at Shiloh for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. So we then have uh, Israel who attacks the Philistines and, and lose. Uh, and so they call for the ark to be brought so that God might give them victory. Uh, but instead, God gives them over to the Philistines and Hophni and Phinehas are killed uh, and the ark is captured by the Philistines. A runner comes back and informs Eli that his sons have died. And, and when that happens, Eli falls over dead. And the Philistines then take the ark back as their prize. They take it back to their land and they set it up in their own temple, the temple of their God, Dagon. Let's look at chapter five. When the Philistines captured the Ark of God, they brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. Then the Philistines took the Ark of God and brought it into the house of D Dagon and set it up beside Dagon. And when the people of the Ashdod rose early in the next day, behold, Dagon had fallen face downward on the ground before the Ark of Yahweh. <clears throat> so they took Dagon and put him back in his place. But when they rose early on the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen face downward on the ground before the Ark of the Lord in the head of Dagon, and his, both of his hands were lying cut off on the threshold, only the trunk of Dagon was left to him. So I want you to see just as, as Yahweh did in Egypt, these other gods cannot stand before him. And so you see here very clearly, very vividly in this story that Dagon has to fall to the feet of Yahweh. Uh, and so if the, the ark is the footstool of Yahweh, Dagon is bowed in worship to Yahweh. And so because this happens and, and uh, their, their God is utterly destroyed before them uh, in, the, in his own temple uh, because of the might and the power of Yahweh, the Philistines uh, become scared and they send the ark back to Israel out of fear. 
Let's look at verse, or excuse me, chapter seven. And the men of Kiriath Jerim came and took the ark, or took up the ark of the Lord and brought it to the house of Abinadab on the hill. And they consecrated his son, Eleazar, to have charge of the ark of the Lord. And from that day, the ark was large, lodged in Kiriath Jerim. A long time passed, some 20 years, and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. And Samuel said to all the house of Israel, if you were return, excuse me, if you're returning to the Lord with all your heart, then put away the foreign gods and the Ashtaroth from among you and direct your heart to the Lord and serve him only. And he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. So the people of Israel put away the balls and the Ashtaroth and they serve the Lord only. So here we begin, we see the, the same things happening. They're still in this cycle of, of judges and God has now raised up Samuel as a judge for them. And he tells the people to put away their foreign gods and to serve Yahweh only. Then the people said, gather all Israel, or excuse me, then Samuel said, gather all Israel at Mizpah and I will pray to the Lord for you. So they gathered in Mizpah and drew water and poured it out before the Lord and fasted on that day and said, we have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the people of Israel at Mizpah. And when the Philistines heard that the people, people of Israel had gathered in Mizpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against the, went up against Israel. And when the people of Israel heard of it, they were afraid of the Philistines. And the people of Israel said to Samuel, do not cease to, tr to cry out to the Lord, our God, for us, so that he may save us from the hand of the Philistines. So Samuel took a nursing lamb and offered it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. And Samuel cried out to the Lord for Israel, and the Lord answered him. As Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to attack Israel. But the Lord thundered with a mighty sound that day against the Philistines and threw them into confusion, and they were defeated before Israel. And the men of Israel went out from Mizpah and pursued the Philistines and struck them as far as beth -car. Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shem and called its name Ebenezer. For he said, till now the Lord has helped us. So the Philistines were subdued and did not enter, or did not again enter the territory of Israel. And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. So again, this is common for the cycle of judges. God works through the judge to uh, deliver his people from their enemy and also to uh, provide judgment on the enemy. Verse 14, the cities that the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored to Israel from Ekron to Gath and Israel delivered their territory from the hands of the Philistines. There was peace also between Israel and the Amorites. Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life and he went on a circuit year by year to Bethel, Gilgal, and Mizpah, and he judged Israel in all these places. Then he would return to Ramah, for his home was there, and there he judged, or there also he judged Israel, and he built there an altar to the Lord. Now we get to the second section, chapter eight. When Samuel became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn son was Joel, Joel, and the name of his second son, Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba. Yet his son did not; his sons did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people and all that they have said to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. So before this day, Israel was a theocracy it was a government that was governed by god and he ruled through people and now the people are asking for a monarchy because 
they want to be like the other nations. Verse eight, according to the, all the deeds that they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are also doing to you. Now then, obey their voice, only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking for a king from him. He said, these will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. And he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and some to plow his ground and some to reap his harvest and to make his implements of war and his equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his servants. He will take a tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give it to his officers and his servants. He will take your male servants and female servants and the best of your young men and your donkeys and put them to his work. He will take a tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. And in that day, you will cry out because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, No, but there shall be a king over us, that we also may be all like all the nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us to fight our battles. So once again, they're reiterating that they want to be like all the nations that God has called them to be set apart from. Verse 21. And when Samuel heard the words of the people, he re repeated them into the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, obey their voice and make them a king. Samuel said to the men of Israel, go every man to his city. We'll move on to the third section. Chapter 9. There was a man of Benjamin, whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, son of Zeror, son of Bekoroth, son of Aphia, a Benjaminite, a man of wealth. And he had a son whose name was Saul, a handsome young man. There was not a man among the people of Israel more handsome than he. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. Now, I've highlighted these two words just because it shows off some of the characters of Saul, but it also shows you reasons why uh, the people of Israel would follow him, uh, because he was big and tall and handsome. Uh, and even in our culture today, we often look to the biggest of us to be our leaders. Verse 3. Now the donkeys of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. So Kish said to Saul, his son, take one of the young men with you and arise, go and look for the donkeys. And he passed through the hill country of Ephraim and passed through the land of Shalashah, but they did not find them. And they passed through the land of Shalim, but they were not there. Then they passed through the land of Benjamin, but did not find them. And when they came to the land of Zuf, Saul said to his servant who was with him, Come, let us go back, lest my father cease to care about the donkeys and become anxious about us. But he said to him, Behold, there is a man of God in this city, and he is a man who is held in honor, and all that he says comes true. So now let us go there. Perhaps he can tell us the way we should go. And Saul said to his servant, Well done, come, let us go. So they went to the city where the man of God was. As they went up the hill to the city, they met a young woman, or they met young women coming to draw water and said to them, is the seer here? They answered, he is, behold, he is just ahead of you. Hurry, he has come just now to the city because the people of, have a sacrifice today at the high place. As soon as you enter the city, you will find him before he goes up to the high place to eat. For the people will not eat until he comes, since we, he must bless the sacrifice. Afterward, those who are invited will eat. Now go up, for you will meet him immediately. 
So they went up to the city. As they were entering the city, they saw Samuel coming out toward them on his way up to the high place. Now the day before Saul came, the Lord had revealed to Samuel, tomorrow about this time, I will send to you a man from the land of Benjamin, and you shall anoint, anoint him to be prince over my people Israel. He shall save my people from the hand of the Philistines, for they have, for I have seen my people because their cry has come to me. When Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said to him, here is the man of whom I spoke to you. He it is who shall restrain my people. A quick note here at the bottom, you see uh, just a note, actually a, a verse th that we skipped over that says that today's prophet was formerly called a seer. So when it says, uh, Saul asked, is the seer here, they're referring to uh, uh, a prophet. 9 verse 18. Then Saul approached Samuel in the gate and said, tell me, where is the house of the seer? Samuel answered Saul, I am the seer. Go up before me to the high place, for today you shall eat with me, and in the morning I will let you go and will tell you all that is, in, that is on your mind. As for your donkeys that were lost three days ago, do not set your mind on them, for they have been found. Then Samuel took Saul and his young men and brought them into the hall and gave them a place at the head of those who had been invited, who were about 30 persons. And Saul said to the cook, Bring the portion I gave you, of which I said to you, put it aside. So the cook took the, up the leg and, was, and what was on it and set it before Saul. And Samuel said, See, what was kept is set before you. Eat because it was kept for you until the hour appointed that you might eat with the guests. So Saul ate with Samuel that day. And when they came down from the high place into the city, a bed was spread for Saul on the roof, and he laid down to sleep. And at the break of dawn, Samuel called to Saul on the roof, up that I may send you on your way. So Saul arose, and both he and Samuel went out into the street. As they were going down to the outskirts of the city, Samuel said to Saul, tell the servant to pass on before us. And when he is passed on, stop here yourself for a while, that I may make known to you the word of God. Then Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it on his head and kissed him and said, Has not the Lord appointed you to be prince over his people Israel? And you shall reign over the people of the Lord, and you shall save them from the hand of their surrounding enemies. And this shall be the sign to you that the Lord has anointed you to be the prince over his heritage. And when he turned his back to leave Samuel, God gave him another heart. So we see here uh, at the end of this little story about Saul being anointed king, that at the end of it, God gives him another heart. Um, and it's very clear by the, the text that, that the Holy Spirit has, has come upon Saul at this point. From there, Samuel gathers the people and proclaims Saul as king before them. Uh, and Saul goes on to lead Israel to defeat the Ammonites. Soon thereafter, Saul retires as judge and, and heads to his home. Let's look at chapter 12, verse 19. And all the people said to Samuel, pray for your servants, the Lord, that we may not die. For we have added to all our sins this evil to ask ourselves for a king. <clears throat> and Samuel said to his people, do not be afraid. You have done all this evil. Yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. And do not turn aside after empty things that cannot prof profit or deliver, for they are empty. For the Lord will not forsake his people for, the great, for his great name's sake, because it has pleased the Lord to make you a people for himself. Moreover, as for me, be it far or be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you, and I will instruct you in the good and the right way. Only fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart, for consider what great things he has done for you. But if you still do wickedly, you shall be swept away, both you and your king. So again, going along with the covenant, God gives them uh, instruction. Uh, or Samuel here gives them instruction by God uh, 
to continue to fear the Lord, to honor the Lord, to follow the Lord with all their heart. And, uh, and then a warning that if they don't do so, they will be swept away, both them and their king. So later on, Saul leads the Israelites to fight the Philistines at Gilgal, and his now grown son, Jonathan, is with him. Uh, as they go up to battle, Samuel doesn't show up in time for the battle. And so because of that, Saul offers a burnt sacrifice to Yahweh himself. Let's look at chapter 12, verse 11. Samuel shows up here and he says, what have you done? And Saul says, when I saw that the people were scattering from me and that you did not come within the days appointed and that the Philistines had mustered at Michmash, I said, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal and I have not sought the favor of the Lord. So I forced myself and offered the burnt offering. Again, this is something only the priest can do. Verse 13, and Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the command of the Lord, your God, with which he commanded you. For then the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom will shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. Saul then foolishly gives many of the Israelites weapons to the Philistine blacksmiths to be sharpened uh, and leaves many of the Israelites unprepared for battle. But yet God provides victory through a surprise attack by Jonathan, uh, Saul's son. During the fight, Saul foolishly, once again, which is his, his normal pattern now, Saul foolishly vows that any of his men who eat before the battle will be killed. Uh, but Jonathan doesn't know this because he's off and he started the battle himself and he ends up eating honeycomb. And so Saul is determined to kill his own son because he broke Saul's vow. And it's only by Saul's, uh, or excuse me, it's only by the, the soldiers who come and ransom Jonathan for, from Saul uh, that, that Jonathan gets to live. Uh, and so because of Saul's distraction with this whole event, uh, the Philistines actually retreat and, and get out of Dodge before they are defeated. Uh, but Saul continues to fight well against all of Israel's enemies around him. Let's look at chapter 15. And Samuel said to Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint you over the king, over, anoint you king over the people Israel. Now, therefore, listen to the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I have noted what Amalek did to Israel in opposing them on the way they came up out of Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that they have. Do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. So here, God gives a hard command. Uh, Amalek was uh, not only unkind, but uh, wanted to, to, to battle. They were, they were evil. Uh, not only doing what God didn't want them to do, but also in attacking and provoking Israel. And so God has set them aside for destruction. And here he says he wants, he wants everything gone, everything to be killed. And so that's where we're left off. Let's look at verse 7. And Saul defeated the Amalekites from Havilah as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and devoted to destruction all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fatted calves and of the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. All that was despised and worthless, they devoted to destruction. So very clear here that, that Saul did not follow God's command. Again, he's acting foolishly. Verse 10, the word of the Lord came to Samuel. I regret that I have made Saul king for he has turned 
back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And Samuel was angry, and he cried to the Lord all night. And Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, and it was told to Sam, er, and it was told Samuel, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set up a monument for himself, and turned and passed on and went to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed be you to the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, Has the Lord a great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, it is better to it is to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination, and presume and presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Verse 24. Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now, therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me, that I may bow before the Lord. And Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you, for you have rejected the word of your Lord, or of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. And Samuel turned to go away. Saul seized the skirt of his robe, and it tore. And Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you to this day, and has given it to your a neighbor of yours who is better than you. Then Samuel said, Bring me. Bring here to me Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And Agag came to him cheerfully. Agag said, surely the bitterness of death is past. And Samuel said, as your sword made women childless, so shall your mother be childless among women. And Samuel hacked Agag to pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. Then Samuel went to Ramah, and Samuel went up to his house in Gibeah of Saul. Or she went, and Saul went up to his house in the Gibeah of Saul. And Samuel did not see Saul again until the day of his death. But Samuel grieved over Saul. And the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. There's two notes on here. The first one is just a note here on the bottom talking about this word regret. Um, it, it's probably the best word that we have to describe <clears throat> the Hebrew word itself. Uh, but in verse 11 and 35, it actually portrays God's sorrow at making Saul king, not necessarily regret. Uh, and in verse 29, uh, it's talking about him having his mindset and not changing his mind. Uh, you'll notice here, this story is very Tolkien-esque. It's, it, it's, it's, you get the idea of, of an epic kind of uh, story, whether it be... Uh, Lord of the Rings or Beowulf, uh, the Odyssey. The, this is the kind of, of, of epic writing that we see in the Bible. And uh, because of that, you have a lot of writers uh, who borrow from the Bible, who borrow uh, both names and as well as uh, characters uh, and especially archetypes. Uh, the archetypes that are found in the Bible can be found in almost any uh, book or film. And so we come across a point here uh, where we have an evil king named Agag, and it's very similar to uh, Tolkien's Azog, the Defiler uh, from The Hobbit. Uh, so you'll notice this, and not all of these are, are directly related, but there's a lot of crossover and a lot of things that that writers borrow. Uh, and so we see th these kind of things all in our literature and in our movies. Let's move on to the, the last section. Chapter 16. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you grieve over Saul since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. And I will send you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. So I highlighted Bethlehemite here just because uh, 
if you know anything about the Bible, you know that that Bethlehem's going to continue to play in this story. Verse two, and Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord and invite Jesse to the sacrifice. And I will show you what you should do. And you shall anoint for me him who I declare to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, do you come peaceably? He said, peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice and he consecrated jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice uh we skip down to verse 11 and samuel has gone through all of uh jesse's sons and god hasn't pointed out the right son to him yet and so we get to verse 11 then samuel said to jesse are all your sons here and he says there remains yet the youngest but behold he is keeping the sheep and samuel said to jesse send and get him for we will not sit down until he comes and he sent and brought him in now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome and the lord said arise anoint him for this is he then samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers and the spirit of the Lord upon David, or the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David that day forward. I want to note that real quick. So we saw earlier that that the spirit of the Lord was on Saul at, when he was king, and just after he uh, was anointed, and we see the same thing happens here with David. That after David is anointed as king, the spirit of the Lord comes upon him. And that's going to set us up for what happens next. Verse 14. Now the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. All right. So we see that spirit of the Lord had left Saul. And now it, the spirit of the Lord rests on David. 14. Now the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him. Let's pause there. So you notice the, the wording of this. It says a harmful spirit from the lord so you can actually take the word that's translated harmful here and translate that as evil also uh, but the point that the translators are trying to make to you is that it's not intended to be used as evil in this sense because it sends the wrong message uh, god sends sp spirits or his angels uh, to people uh, as he wills and just because God sends somebody to play uh, a, uh, I would say, a stumbling block for somebody, that doesn't make that spirit necessarily evil. And so that's why they go with the word harmful here. So we'll look in the box here to the left. There's a quote from Michael Heiser in Demons. The evil spirit sent by God to trouble Saul, therefore, may be a mental affliction or a psychological disposition. Even if spirit beings are in view, it is incoherent to conclude that when God sends these spirits to judge wickedness, that they themselves are evil. Uh, so the point that I want you to see here is that God isn't sending a an evil spirit or a demon that uh, is a pawn in Satan's army. He's not sending one of these guys to torment Saul, but he's actually sending one of his own, one of his own angels or one of his own spirits to uh, be a harmful spirit to Saul, to, to trouble him uh, because he has disobeyed God. Let's look at verse 15. And Saul's servants said to him, behold, now a harmful spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord now command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who is skillful in playing the lyre. And when the harmful spirit from God is upon you, he will play it and you will be well. So Saul said to his servants, provide for me a man who can play well and bring him to me. One of the young men answered, behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing a man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a man of good presence, and the Lord is with him. Therefore Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, Send me David your son, who is with the sheep. And Jesse took 
the don a donkey laden with bread and a skin of wine and a young goat and sent them by David, his son, to Saul. And David came to Saul and entered his service. And Saul loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. Then Saul, excuse me, and Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Let David remain in my service, for he has found favor in my sight. And whenever the harmful spirit from God was upon Saul, David took the lyre and played it from or with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the harmful spirit departed from him. So we see here that, that God uses the harmful spirit to bring David into Saul's service, to bring him near the king uh, himself. Let's move on. So soon thereafter, uh, David volunteers to fight Goliath when the Israelites fear. They're all afraid of this man. Uh, I have a note here that there's some manuscript difference here that so, uh, Goliath is either nine foot nine or six foot nine, depending on how you parse it. Uh, the, the Septuagint, which is that acronym there, LXX, the Septuagint actually has it written down at six point nine, or excuse me, six foot nine. Uh, and this is probably the more accurate because the Septuagint is coming from uh, earlier manuscripts than we have today uh, on the Hebrew side. So uh, it's, it's fair to say that the Goliath was probably six foot nine, uh, which still makes him a giant when uh, all the other people are five foot tall. Uh, note here by his statue, and, or excuse me, his stature and his affiliation with the Philistines, uh, Goliath, Goliath is then assumed to be uh, one of these offspring of the Nephilim, some of the giants. So David kills Goliath and the Israel, Israelites rout the Philistines. And soon thereafter, David and Jonathan, remember Jonathan is Saul's son, become best friends. Saul ends up putting David in charge of uh, thousands. So he's, he's a commander in charge of thousands because he's a great warrior. And his fame is known because of his killing of Goliath. But uh, Saul quickly becomes jealous because as David goes out and fights, his reputation begin to, begins to grow and, and his men are loyal to him and the citizens are becoming loyal to him because they see him as this great, great fighter. And they even say that, that Saul has killed his thousands, but David has killed his tens of thousands. Uh, and so Saul becomes uh, insanely jealous over this. Uh, Saul promises to give David uh, his eldest daughter, if he would go and, and kill a thousand Philistines and, and, and bring back a prize from them. Uh, you guys can read about that if you want. Uh, and David actually brings back twice as many as Saul asked for. And yet Saul goes back on his word and, and gives his eldest daughter to someone else. Uh, David does end up marrying his, his second daughter. Saul gives a second daughter to, to David, but, uh, he has already gone back on his word. Uh, soon thereafter, Saul's jealousy be, continues to grow, and Saul begins to try to kill David. Uh, but Jonathan stands up for him. And then we come to chapter 20, verse 30. Then Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan, and he said to him, You son of a perverse, rebellious woman, do I not know that you have chosen the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of your mother's nakedness? For as long as the son of Jesse lives on the earth, neither you nor your kingdom will be established. Therefore, sin and bring him to me, for he shall surely die. Then Jonathan answered Saul, his father, but why should he be put to death? What has he done? But Saul hurled his spear at him to strike him. So Jonathan knew his father was determined to put David to death. And Jonathan arose from the table in fierce anger, and he ate no food the second day of the month, for he was grieved for David because his father had disgraced him. So uh, Jonathan relays this information to David and David takes uh, a bunch of guys with him and they flee and they're hiding in caves and in forests. David moves his parents to Moab to protect them so that Saul won't come and kill them in Bethlehem. Uh, and so Saul chases after David. He ends up killing a bunch of priests at Nob who had unwittingly helped David, uh, but one of them escapes and joins David's men and uh, tells them all that's happened. 
uh, David then protects a city of the city of Kila by defeating Philist Philistines there. And, uh, and Saul finds out about it and con continues to pursue David and, and starts coming closer and closer to him. Let's look at chapter 22, verse 15. David saw that Saul had come to seek his life. David was in the wilderness of Ziph at Horesh. And Jonathan, Saul's son, rose and went to David at Horesh and strengthened his hand in God. And he said to him, Do not fear, for the hand of Saul my father shall not find you. You shall be king over Israel, and I shall be next to you. Saul my father also knows this. And the two of them made a covenant before the Lord. David remained at Horesh, and Jonathan went home. So here, Jonathan is, is making a covenant with David, that he's willing to serve David, that he knows that, that God has raised David up to be the next king. Uh, shortly thereafter, Saul almost catches David, but God uses uh, the Philistines' attacks uh, in nearby villages to call him away. Chapter 24. When Saul returned from following the Philistines, he was told, Behold, David is in the wilderness of Engedi. When Saul took 3,000 men out, to the, out of all Israel and went to seek David and his men in front of the wild goat's rocks. And he came to the sheepfolds, by the way, and there was a cave. And Saul went in to relieve himself. Now David and his men were sitting in the innermost parts of the cave. And the men of David said to him, Here's the day in which the Lord said to you, Behold, I will give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as it, it shall seem good to you. Then David arose and stealth, stealthily cut off a corner of Saul's robe. And afterward, David's heart struck him because he had cut off a corner of Saul's robe. And he said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to put out my hand against him, seeing that he is the Lord's anointed. So David persuaded his men with these words and did not permit them to attack Saul. And Saul rose up and left the cave and went on his way. Afterward, David also arose and went out of the cave and called after Saul, my lord, the king. And when the Saul looked behind him, David bowed his face to the earth and paid homage. And David said to Saul, why do you listen to the words of the men who say, behold, David seeks your harm? Behold, this day your eyes have seen how the Lord gave you today into my hand in the cave. And some told me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not put out my hand against the Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. See, my father, I, see, excuse me, see, my father, see the corner of your robe in my hand, for by the fact that I cut off the corner of your robe and did not kill you, you may know and see that there is no wrong or treason in my hands. I have not sinned against you, though you hunt my life to take it. May the Lord judge between you and me. May the Lord avenge me against you but my hand shall not be against you. As the proverb of the ancients say, out of the wicked comes wickedness, but my hand shall not be against you. After whom was the king of Israel to come out? After whom do you pursue? After a dead dog? After a flea? May the Lord therefore be judge and give sentence between me and you and see it and plead my cause and deliver me from your hand. As soon as David has finished speaking these words to Saul, Saul said, Is this your voice, my son David? And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. He said to David, You are more righteous than I, for you have repaid me good, whereas I have repaid you evil. And you have declared to me this day how you have dealt with me, in that you did not kill me when the Lord put me into your hands. So here we, we see the contrast between the two men of the evil things that Saul's done and, and the bad person he's become and how David is seeking after Yahweh, that he's seeking the heart of Yahweh and that he's doing the things that are right. And so David is the righteous one. Continuing on verse 19, for if a man finds his enemy, will he let him go away safe? So may the Lord reward you with good for what you have done to me this day. And now behold, I know that you will surely be king and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in your hand. Swear to me, therefore, by the Lord, that you will not cut off my offspring after me, that you will not destroy my name out of my father's house. And David swore this to Saul. And Saul went home 
but David and his men went up to the stronghold. Uh, after that, uh, Samuel dies, uh, and David goes off and acquires two wives because Saul has given his first wife to another man in his absence. So David starts to build a family. And a little while later, Saul decides that he, he needs to kill David again. This, the same anger and, and sickness, uh, jealousy comes upon him. He decides he needs to kill David again. So David, uh, he's pursuing David. And David, once again, sneaks into Saul's camp while he sleeps, but, but takes a few things and spares his life. And he points it out to Saul. And again, Saul uh, realizes or declares that he himself has been sinful and, and says he's going to leave David alone. Uh, but David doesn't trust that anymore. And so he goes to live with the Philistines in Gath because he fears that Saul will eventually come and kill him. Uh, while he's in Gath, him and his men keep uh, taking off for days at a time and plundering Canaanite tribes, uh, which both uh, judges them and allows David and his men to grow wealthy. Skip down to chapter 28. Now Samuel had died, and all of Israel had mourned for him and buried him at Ramah, his own city. And Saul had put the mediums and the necromancers out of the land. The Philistines assembled and came and encamped at Shunem. And Saul gathered all Israel and they encamped at Gilboa. When Saul saw that the army of the Philistines, or when Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid and his heart trembled greatly. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him, either by dreams or the Urim or the prophets. Then Saul said to his servants, seek out for me a woman who is a medium, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servants said to him, behold, there is a medium at Endor. Again, just a note here. Uh, we talked earlier about uh, literature reusing things from the Bible. Here's a, a very distinct uh, use of that in uh, George Lucas's Star Wars. Uh, what he calls the planet indoor. Verse eight. So Saul disguised himself and put on other garments and went, he and his two men with him. And they came to the woman by night. And he said, divine for me a spirit and bring up for me whomever I shall name to you. The woman said to him, surely you know what Saul has done, how he has cut off mediums and the necromancers. <clears throat> Shoot me. Hold on a second. Like, <coughs> Sorry about that. How he has cut off the mediums and the necromancers from the land. Why then are you laying a trap for my life to bring about my death? But Saul swore to her by the Lord. As the Lord lives, no punishment shall come to you for, upon you for you, this thing. Then the woman said, whom shall I bring up for you? He said, bring up Samuel for me. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice. And the woman said to Saul, why have you deceived me? You are Saul. The king said to her, do not be afraid. What do you see? And the woman said to Saul, I see a God coming up out of the earth. And he said to her, what is his appearance? And she said, an old man is coming up and he is wrapped in a robe. And Saul knew that it was Samuel. And he bowed with his face to the ground and paid homage. A quick note here, uh, where she says, I see a God coming up out of the earth. That word there is Elohim. Elohim is a typically used for either a spirit or an angel or a uh, God uh, could be plural as well. Uh, and so she's saying, I see this spiritual being coming up out of the earth. <clears throat> Down to verse 15. Then Samuel said to Saul, why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? Saul answered, I am in great distress for the Philistines are warring against me. And God has turned away from me and answers me no more, either by prophets or by dreams. Therefore, I have summoned you to tell me what I should do. And Samuel said, why then do you ask me since the Lord has turned from you and has become your enemy? The Lord has done to you as you as he spoke to me, for the Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hand and give has and given it to your neighbor, David. 
Because you did not obey the voice of the Lord and did not carry out his fierce wrath against Amalek, therefore the Lord has done this thing to you this day. Moreover, the Lord will give Israel also with you into the hands of the Philistines, and tomorrow you and your sons shall be with me. Uh, talking about, so Samuel says, you and your sons will be with me. Uh, he's talking about here in, Sh in Sheol, in the land of the dead. The Lord will give the army of Israel also into the hand of the Philistines. So the, the king of Gath <clears throat> comes out against uh, Israel, and he wants David to fight with him. Uh, but these Philistine commanders refuse. They don't want David on their side because they're, uh, I don't know if they're afraid of being one-upped or if they're afraid of David turning on them, but they don't want David to fight alongside them. And so the king of Gath sends David and his men back to the city. <clears throat> while they're gone, uh, uh, or while David and his men were gone, they come back and, and find that uh, their camp had been raided by the Amalekites and that their wives and children and all of their possessions have been taken. And so David consults Yahweh and pursues and defeats the Amalekites. Uh, and he returns to Gath, but sends gifts to the elders in Judah of his plunder. Uh, while all that's going on, we get back to the battle with the Israelites. Uh, so this is the following day <clears throat> after Saul's visit to the uh, medium in Endor. Chapter 31. Now the Philistines were fighting against Israel, and the men of Israel fled before the Philistines and fell slain on Mount Gilboa. And the Philistines overtook Saul and his sons, and the Philistines struck down Jonathan and Abinadab and Malchishua, the sons of Saul. And when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he also fell upon his sword and died with him. Thus Saul died, and his three sons, and his armor bearer, and all his men on the same day together. And when the men of Israel who were on the other side of the valley, and whose and those beyond the Jordan saw that the men of Israel had fled and that Saul and his sons were dead. They abandoned their cities and fled. And the Philistines came, came and lived in them. So Philistines completely destroy the Israelites here at this battle. And not only that, but now they take over their nearby villages and, and begin living there. <clears throat> and so that brings us to the end of 1 Samuel. And so... Uh, we come to the end of First Samuel, and and uh, this is kind of where we're left off. The Israelites have continued to fail to follow the commands of Yahweh, and the, the cycle of judges uh, proved uh, to not work for them, that they, they just kept turning their backs on God over and over, and eventually they demand for themselves a king. <clears throat> uh, they want to be just like all of the other nations, which God has told them to be set apart from. Uh, and so God relents and provides them a king. And in doing so, he chooses them a king that they would accept. <clears throat> Not necessarily the king that he wanted, but the king that they would accept. And Saul turns out in the end to be a bad king. And so now we have an empty throne in Israel. And so that's where we leave it this week. Next week, we'll get into 2 Samuel and get into the second part of this story. So if you have any questions, I'd love to hear them. Uh, please put them down below. Feel free to comment. Uh, and thank you for being with us and have a great night.